Hello, everyone. Hello, my name is Linda Peavy. I am the owner of Apov Consulting LLC, and I am so happy that you are joining me this evening to learn how to fund your organization. Thank you so much. We are going to have a jam, I mean, a jam packed hour for you. It will last a little bit longer than an hour. So come on into the room. Again, I'm Linda Peavy. I'm going to be your host for this evening. And I'm in Ohio. So let me know where you're coming in from. Give a shout out to your city or your state. And let me know where you're, where you're calling in from. It's like a ch really chilly day today in Ohio, like 31 degrees. Oh my gosh. Okay. Utah. Colorado, Florida, North Texas, Greenville, South Carolina, Pensacola, Florida. Wow, San Lucas, Mexico. Joliet, did I pronounce that right? Illinois, Clanton, Alabama. My parents are from Alabama. Texas, New Jersey, Bend, Oregon, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We have the states covered today. So thank you, thank you all. Georgia, New York is in the house. New Jersey, DC is in the house. Ohio, yes. Dayton, my neighbors to the South. So thank you so much. I am so glad you were able to join me again. I'm Linda Peavy. I'm the owner of LaPav Consulting. And we are gonna get started because I, anybody that knows me know this is a no fluff zone, okay? This is not about any fluff. By the time you finish with this webinar, you are going to have some really great skills that will take you on your grant writing journey so that you can stop bootstrapping your women-owned organization so that you will know how to secure funding. So what I'm going to do now is to share my screen. We're gonna get started. We will start off with just a 30 second commercial, which was my commercial that aired late last year, it'll give you a little bit more information about me, who I am, and what we're gonna be in store for today. So, and also you might um, see some information coming into you from my trusty assistant, Erica. She is helping me out today. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and we are going to get started. All right. Hi, I'm Linda Peavy, owner of LaPav Consulting. My passion is to place your organization on the path to excellence. Are you struggling to communicate your message, reach target audiences, or secure funding? From marketing communications to grant writing, we achieve your goals. We've worked with high profile clients and have secured $17 million in funding for charter schools and nonprofits. Call today to discuss what your success looks like and how LaPav Consulting can help. All right, so that's me. I'm Linda Peavy, and we're going to go to the next screen because I want to make sure everyone is in the right place. So you are coming to the webinar tonight, Grant Writing for Women-Owned Businesses, and want to just make sure this is where you're supposed to be. So we're going to move forward with our webinar and just a little bit of housekeeping. So I answer questions at the end of the webinar, so please be sure to stay until the end. And people who know me know I stay until every single question is answered. So while we move along, you can put your questions into the Q&A, um, but also the chat because I do check both. So if you forget to put them in the Q&A, just put them in the chat and we're gonna get to them at the end of the presentation. Again, I am so glad that you decided to join me this evening and we're going to get started. First of all, I wanna make absolutely sure that everyone can see me and hear me. So just give me a yes, give me a yes in the chat if you can hear me okay. And if you can see me okay, because I wanna make absolutely sure. Uh, okay, excellent, everything is good there. All right, so a little bit about me, I'm Linda Peavy. I own LaPav Consulting, this is my 14th year. And I have over 13 years of grant writing experience that includes grants management, grants analysis, proposal development, 
grant fund development. I've written grants in a number of different areas from education, religious programming, youth development, low income education, jobs development, new technology, curriculum resources, salaries, innovative programming, you name it. And to date, I have written over $17 million. And I should say I have secured, there is a difference between writing and securing. So I have secured over $17 million worth of funding and business development. And so I have been asked through many of my clients to write that proposal that you often fill out. So I've written the grant applications, Grant applications are scored. I've written those scoring templates. I've been in charge of grants administration. I've been in charge of cultivating those relationships that are so important to you getting the grant. We'll talk about that later. And I also provide grant writing workshops. So I've provided grant writing workshops to the Urban League and to the Council of Smaller Enterprises and other organizations as well. And I was a former executive director also of a nonprofit. That's really where I started writing uh, grants and, and really became uh, to understand the importance of being able to write a great grant and how that's connected really to you getting your funding. And so a little bit about my journey. I used to be a, a marketing director and associate publisher of a denominational publishing house many years ago. I got hurt and came back home to Cleveland. And as many of you know, Cleveland is like not the publishing mecca of the country, right? So even though I had all this experience in marketing, it was in publishing and <clears throat> excuse me, because I was here in Cleveland, just couldn't get a job and, and literally founded LaPov Consulting out of necessity because I needed to work. And one of my first jobs was to become executive director of a nonprofit. And so while I did that, I realized that once I got into the job, I needed to write a grant to literally save my own salary, right? I had to write a grant that provided for the salary of my position. And so literally, I was thrown into the deep end. And from that moment, I've been writing grants ever since, because I, I came to understand how important they are to really being able to support whether or not you're a nonprofit or a small business. I'm a small business, again, 14 years. So I know the struggle for so many of you, when you don't have sufficient funding, and I am here to help. But it also showed me that connection, right, between learning how to write a grant and then getting the funding. And one thing you want to know is that it is a process. And so here tonight, I'm here to show you what that process is. And so writing, writing grants is about more than just downloading that application and filling it out and sending it in. There are components along the way that you really have to be familiar with. And if, you're, if you don't know what the process is, you're starting at a disadvantage. And so not only am I gonna share with you what to write, I'm gonna share with you how to write it. And then some of the secrets that I've learned over the past 14 years of really how do you get your application noticed? Because as you know, it's very competitive and your grant application is going sometimes into a sea of other applications. So how do you stand out? How do you make it work? So what to write, learning really, what are you gonna to write to showcase your organization services? And it doesn't matter whether or not you are a seasoned company or a startup company. And then how do you write? How do you write that positions you as the best grant candidate? And then I'm gonna share some of those secrets that I told you about that's really gonna help you uh, to be able to highlight your grant application so that you set it apart. So why this class, right? Well, entrepreneurs need help with funding. And so there was a time when it was almost unheard of, right, for a small business owner to get grant money. You consistently heard about, oh, you need seed money, you need loans, you need uh, microfinancing, you need uh, angel investors, but grants, like we always thought grants were just for nonprofit organizations, but the landscape is very different now. But also there's really a lack of qualified professional freelance grant writers. And I say this all the time, there is a difference between someone who writes grants and a professional grant writer. I've heard horror stories about people who say, oh, you know, give me $500 and I'll make sure I can get that grant for you. Or I'll write three grants for $50. 
there's a difference again between someone who writes grants and a professional qualified grant writer. And grant writing, it is a skill and it can be very costly. A qualified seasoned grant writers charge anywhere between $100 to $200 per hour. And so this can be expensive. Why not learn how to do it yourself? Learn the skills so that you know what you're doing. And even if you decide to hire a grant writer, you know what they should be asking. You know the information that they should want from you to be able to develop a really great application. It's impossible for me to help everyone, right, uh, that I want to, who needs the help. So this is one of the reasons why I offer these free grant writing webinars. And so why this class? Well, this is really what I want you to understand. You don't have to be a professional grant writer to secure grants. You have to know the process. And that's what we'll share tonight. Again, what to write, how to write, and then what do you really need to do to get that application noticed. And so two things really changed the grant landscape that I wanna talk about before I start going into the actual writing of the application. One was COVID-19. And we know that before COVID-19 happened, most of the grant money was, was given to nonprofits, but something that COVID did was really kind of peel back the onion layer on just how vulnerable we are as small business owners. And you know, as well as I do, so many businesses just went under. We didn't have the money. We didn't have the revenue. We didn't have the clients to serve. And so it really allowed the United States in particular to take a look at how vulnerable small businesses are. And so what happened is that you had many of your major foundations and many of your major corporations said, look, we, this is something we can we can help, we can address. And so they started to create these pools of money that would be available for small business uh, owners. And it wasn't just the government. Again, it was many foundations. They started to shift pools of money away from some of their more typical areas to small business owners. And again, your Fortune 500 companies were able to start developing these pools of resources that they were going to provide as grants to small businesses. Now, given COVID-19, those emergency funds have pretty much been expended, but we're in a recovery phase now. So the money is still there. That's what you need to know. The money is still available. When you see these applications, you really just need to know, okay, how did COVID-19 affect me? And what would I be able to do with the funds? Many of us have had to pivot our businesses, our organizations, um, I, I do with churches a lot. A lot of churches have to go online, for example. Uh, I work with one organization called One More Way where they provided surf therapy to disabled veterans. Whereas you can imagine, COVID-19 closed the beaches. So we developed an online program where they could reach these veterans with PTSD and provide these uh, services via Zoom. So a lot of us had to do a lot of pivoting throughout COVID-19, um, but the good news is, there's still money, not just with COVID-19, but other money as well that's available to help support a small businesses. So the George Floyd incident was another incident that really changed the landscape of philanthropy. There was this diversity, equity, and inclusion area that companies wanted to give to. They wanted to place money uh, in the hands of either foundations to give to small businesses and nonprofits or to give through their own corporate foundations. So any small businesses, for example, that are addressing any racial justice issues or socially conscious causes are gonna be in a really great position also to get funding. So these are just some of the grant bases that I wanted to start with, just so everyone's on the same page. So grants, a sum of money given by a government or other organization for a particular purpose, Grants are not paid back. That's like the biggest takeaway from this page is that grants are not paid back. Uh, again, pre-COVID-19, pre most all grants and foundation funding went to 501c3 organizations, which is your nonprofit organizations. But now uh, after COVID-19, for-profit organizations like us, small businesses are receiving more grant money than ever before. 
Uh, and the 501c3, if you're a nonprofit, there may be some nonprofits on the line. Um, that is the charitable organization designation by the IRS that you'll need to know in order really to get grant money. So if there are some nonprofits, I know there were some nonprofits that were going to join. So if you're a nonprofit, yes, you will need that 501c3. Be sure to ask, you know, ask your questions um, in the chat and the Q&A, and we will definitely get to them. The grant application proposal, that's simply the document that you're going to be completing uh, whenever you apply for the grant. So sometimes you'll, you might hear grant application, sometimes you might hear grant proposal. Uh, it's really the same thing. So look at these stats, right? In 2015, there were over 86,000 foundations in the United States giving grants totaling over $62 billion. 92% of those foundations were independent, three were corporate, 1% were community organizations. But look at what happened in 2019. A lot of people felt that because of the pandemic, there was less money. And actually the, op the opposite is happening. So in 2019, foundation giving increased right to $75 billion which was a 2.5% increase from 2018. And now it continues to increase. It continues to go up. So don't think that because we were in a pandemic and we're still in a pandemic, that the giving has decreased. That's not true. The money is available. So that's your takeaway. The money is available. It is, again, about how you go about getting it and understanding the process. So before we start into the actual grant application, I provide this information to everybody because it is so important. Make sure before you start the process of writing grants that you go over basic writing skills, right? And it doesn't matter if you are a professional editor, if you're a professor, go through just basic writing skills, which these are the top five, proper spelling and punctuation, good reading comprehension. You wanna make sure that what you write is what people will understand as they read your words. Sentence and paragraph structure, knowledge of different types of writing. As you can imagine, writing a nonprofit novel is different than writing a book of poems. But this last one is really key, and that's editing and rewriting. Editing and rewriting. This is so important. You don't want to have this beautiful grant application full of grammatical errors. And that's where Grammarly comes into place. Grammarly is a professional software editing package. It's software that you can download into your Word uh, documents. You can have it in Outlook. And what it does, it provides you with editing skills so that your document comes out a lot cleaner. Now, there's a regular subscription for Grammarly, which is free. That's the best part. Grammarly is free. And then there's a professional Grammarly which is about $120 um, a year uh, for you nonprofits. I know right now that Grammarly Professional is free for nonprofits, but for us small businesses, it's only about $120 a year and I, oh, it is so worth it. But what I want you to note now is that this particular blog is fantastic. I want everyone who's on the webinar to download it. Erica, if you could put the link into the chat. This is a article called Improve Writing Skills Dramatically by Doing These 15 Things. It is wonderful. Doesn't matter what level of skill you currently are in your writing journey, it will improve your writing. So I want to make sure everyone uh, has access to the link because it will absolutely, absolutely improve your writing. All right. So we are preparing to write the grant application. So these are some of the things you need to do before, again, before you consider writing the grant application. Make sure you have your documents in order, your EIN, that's your employer identification number. Again, if you're a nonprofit, your 501c3 letter. And I advise uh, the nonprofits not to use a fiscal agent, but to get your 501c3. It takes about two months from the IRS. This is critical. Your certificate of incorporation, your bylaws, and your state certification. Businesses make absolutely sure before you submit one single grant application that you are in good standing to even do business in your state. 
I was on my webinar about maybe six weeks ago and I was talking about this area and a young lady said, this is, she, she was talking in the chat. She said, this is so true. She had applied for a grant and there were multiple applicants. And she said she was the only one who secured the grant because she was the only one that was able to provide her state certification, indicating that she was in good standing in her state. And to make sure that your business is in good standing in your state, go to your Secretary of State's website and put in your name. And if, if you're in good standing, your state certification should show up. So make sure you go to your Secretary of State's website and look for your state certification. If you don't have it, start the process of getting it. Your list of board of directors and your staff, your letters of support. Now this becomes really important before you submit your grant application because it takes time, right? To get the letters of support. You wanna ask people to support what you're doing. Maybe they've worked with you before. Maybe they're vendors. Um, maybe they are people who know your journey, but you want to ask for these letters of support because it may take time to be able to compile everything. Your audit financial statements. Financial statements are just critical. And now this varies per state. I know in California, for example, if your revenues are under $2 million, you don't need an audit financial statement, but it is always up to the funder or the foundation because they can still require it. Your current operating budget, right? Make sure you have a current operating budget. And I always ask people to make sure that it's accurate because from that operating budget, you should be able to determine how much your ask is going to be. And the ask is what is the amount of the grant application. List of any other funding sources, right? So no funder really wants to be the only organization that's providing you money. So who else has funded you? And it doesn't have to be in money. Maybe you did get a grant from somewhere else, or maybe you have angel investors, but it could also be in-kind donations or in-kind services. It looks good to say, okay, I already have a pool of organizations that have provided me with funding, whether it's in-kind services or not. So make sure you have these documents ready before you move forward with the grant application. Now we're gonna talk about what to write. So these are the grant components and these are the typical grant components in every grant application. You have your summary abstract, mission vision, history, leadership, description of the organization, the statement of need or your target market, a description of your program, your project, or your service uh, as an organization, as a business, your community partnerships, your outcomes, outputs, and impact, or rather outputs, outcomes, and impact, your program, project, staff, or the staff that you have at your business, your leadership, this really pertains to your board, your budget, and then sustainability, which we'll talk about a little bit later um, because that really um, speaks to after the grant money is gone, how are you going to sustain whatever that service was or whatever that product was uh, that allowed you to get, um, allowed you to use the grant money? And so now we're gonna go through every component. The summary abstract, what you need to know about it, it will be the very first part of your grant application. It's the first thing you see. However, you always write it last because what you're going to do is take the most important components of every section of your grant application to create your summary abstract. So don't be fooled, even though it's the first thing you see, it should be the last thing you write. And it's gotta be compelling because it's going to answer like, why you? Why are you the person to get the funding and why now? You're gonna include all of your statistics and you're gonna include what we call the ask. And again, the ask, that's the amount of your grant money that you're going to be asking. So the mission vision statement, and many of you may have a mission statement for your business, but do you have a vision statement? Because many grant applications will ask for both. So the mission, what are you doing now? What are your aims, your goals? That's your mission statement. Your vision statement is really about what would you like to have happen in the future if you accomplish the mission statement? You need to align it to the funder. This becomes very, very, very important. This is how you know you found the right funder or the right foundation. Make sure that your mission is completely in alignment with the mission 
of your foundation or your corporation that you're seeking funds from. And it's good to research the history of that organization's founder. There was one particular situation where I was working with the veterans organization and it wasn't immediately apparent that they were supporting veterans organizations, but they came up in a search. And the more I started to research the organization, I found out that the, the founder was a World War II veteran. And so he did have this, this deep seated um, desire to help veterans. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's so important to research the history of the founder of whatever organization, especially if it's a smaller um, foundation that you'll be pursuing. History. Every organization has a history. And many of you who are startups, who are just starting your small business, may think, well, you know, this is new. I'm just starting up. I just have an idea. I don't have a history. Every organization has, has a history. Because think about what was the impetus for you starting your new organization or your new ministry, your new business? That's part of the history, too. What led you to believe that you wanted to open up this small business? Was it something in your prior work, your prior history? That can be part of the history of the founding of the organization as well. So don't think that just because you're a startup, you don't have a history. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, if you are, for example, a previous principal, right? And you wanna start a business that is a tutoring uh, organization where you go in or your employees go in and they tutor high school students after school. And this is new, right? This is, you're just starting up. You may think, well, I don't really have a history. Well, if you're a principal, you probably have what, 10, 15 years of working with that target population because as a principal, you dealt with students for many, many years. And so your work as a principal might've been the catalyst for you saying, okay, I wanna give back. I wanna to continue to help these students after school that becomes a part of the history. So the leadership section is going to include your executive leadership, your CEO, your COO. Um, that's going to be um, important. Your board of directors, uh, the description of your organization, that's a, a component that you want to write about that really includes what is the track record of working with the target population? If you are a seasoned organization, what are your success rates, right? What are your success factors? What is your experience with the subject matter, for example? But again, if you're a startup, go back to that impetus of why you started the organization. So you wanna talk about its purpose, its mission. And again, if it's new, really look at the experience of the leadership that's starting um, your business and what were some of the catalysts that allow you or that really wanted you, that compel you to start your small business. So the statement of need is a, really about what problem are you solving? And the one thing I want to get you to understand is that there is always a problem. There's always a problem. The question is how are you resolving that problem? So it could be you're starting something new or you're making something better. So I give this example of, let's say you wanna start a, a bakery, right? You wanna maybe start a, a cupcake shop. And you may think, well, you know what, how is that solving a problem? Well, maybe you're positioning your location in a downtown area that doesn't have another bakery within five miles. So that's the problem you're resolving. You're putting a bakery in a downtown community that doesn't, didn't have a bakery that may be delivered before. So the business people didn't really have a fresh bakery uh, for their catering services. Or if they were walking at lunchtime, they didn't have a really great bakery, you're solving a problem. So always think about whatever it is, no matter what you're doing, you should be doing something original or making something better. One of the two, you're creating something original or you're improving upon some type of a process, doesn't matter what your small business is. And then are you connecting the target problem to the funders areas of interest? And this becomes so critical. Sometimes we see these large major foundations like the Ford Foundation and the, the Bill Gates Foundation and the Walton Foundation. We're like, oh my gosh, you're giving away so much money. I, I, I've got to apply. 
without wondering, well, their areas of interest, maybe they don't align with what I'm providing. You have to make sure that there is a connection between what you're trying to accomplish and the funders areas of interest. So let's go back to the bakery, right? You may not find a foundation that just wants to start funding cupcake companies, but maybe they want to start funding women-owned businesses, right? And you're a woman-owned business. So make sure that that area of interest is a part of the funders or the foundation's information. Now, how do you find out what the funder wants to fund? How do you connect yourself to get to that perfect funder? Well, there's two predominant ways. One is you check their 990s. So the 990 is the document that a foundation or an organization completes, it's the tax return to the IRS. And on that 990, typically, at the very back of the 990, it's going to give you a list of all of the organizations that that foundation or that corporation has funded. You look at that list and you look for similarities. So maybe there's other women-owned businesses, or maybe um, if you are focused on youth development, you see that, okay, they have been funding youth development organizations. So you make that connection on the 990. How do you get the 990, you ask? Well, I've got some tea for you. There's a website that you can go to and you can get every 990, just pretty much every 990 that's available completely free of charge that you can download. And so that you can look at that 990 and start making those matches and finding out whether or not that is a 990 that's going to detail to you, okay, this is a foundation that was able to fund someone who's doing something similar to what I'm doing. And this becomes important. I mean, you can always look at the foundation website, but keep in mind that only that 90%, 90% of foundations do not have a website. And I'll repeat that. 90% of foundations do not have a website. So that's where the, the 990 comes in. So you download that 990, you take a look and you find out who it is that that organization is, is, is funding. And you, you will come to that organization based on your grant search. And we'll talk about some mechanisms a little bit later as to how you uh, research. So the link, uh, should be in there where you can um, open up and get 990s. And Erica, if you could include the HTTPS and that way they can click on the link and go right to uh, any of the URLs that we're gonna be sharing. So keep in mind, how are you resolving the problem? Different, right? As a small business, different or better than anyone else. That is going to be your focus. The other area of a grant application is your target population. And this is all about who are you helping, right? Maybe as a woman-owned business, you're only targeting women, right? You're only targeting um, elderly women, or maybe you're targeting a particular gender that's part of the population. So demographics are important, right? And so let's take that bakery. Uh, store, for example. So their demographics could be the business people within a, a mile radius of their store, right? Because you know that at lunchtime, they, they, they will be taking uh, lunch and they may need uh, dessert. So that may be your, your target population. Look at the, ge the geography of your target or your community market. Maybe you're only focused on Again, one part of the city, a one mile radius of your store, maybe it's the whole city or the county, or maybe it's all across the United States. One of the best avenues to really dive deep into get your demographics is the US Census Fast Facts. I absolutely love it because it's so great in being able to tell you different regions, they break down employment, they break down age, income, gender, ethnicity, employment rates. So if you are really targeting a particular market, utilize the U.S. Census Fast Facts because it is such a fabulous uh, resource to have. But at the end of the day, keep in mind 
your program should help to resolve some issue. So the statement of need, right? We talked about either it's the target population or it could be a statement of need. What is it that you're resolving? And I worked with one particular uh, small business that was a beauty academy and they wanted a grant to pay for operations costs because they were starting a program that was really geared towards high school students to study cosmetology and to become self-sufficient. And so that's where the need came into play uh, because in that particular city, there was not one single program in high school that offered any type of cosmetology uh, sessions through the state, through the, through the Department of Education. And so there was a need there. Plus there was a need for organizations to really support women owners of beauty academies. Now you see women who own salons, but how many women do you know who own beauty academies? So there was a need there for that level of support. The target population were these underrepresented minority high school students that wanted to be self-sufficient once they left high school, but didn't have the avenue to do so. And so with this particular small business, the grant was going to be to help pay for her operations cost. And so this is similar to how that statement of need looked. Of course, it was um, I was able to extrapolate on it, but I'll read through this quick so you get an idea. So again, we're talking about your statement of need. You're talking about your problem area, your problem statement, or your target demographic. So we start off with too many young adults lack the opportunity to become trained in the cosmetology field while in high school. That's a problem. For more than 10 years, the Ohio School District has not offered a career training program in the field of cosmetology. That's another problem. Therefore, the ABC Academy is an opportunity for high school students to study in the high demand field during and after their high school years. So now we're coming up to some stats. Within this recession-proof industry in 2019, the ethnic hair market alone garnered $876 million in the US. In partnership with the local school district, again, we're looking at partnerships. I'll talk about that later. They're so important. We have completed our first pilot program with John Smith High School. We saw six students complete training in June 2019. These students are now fully prepared to take their natural hair care license exam. Students who receive the ABC Academy classes along with training, okay, this is how we're going to overcome the problem. Students who receive the ABC Academy classes along with training, mentorship and professional development earn on average more than $50,000 annually. So that's how you are addressing the problem. You're addressing this, this statement of need. And now we're wrapping it back around to the funder. We believe our program aligns, right? You're aligning it back to the mission of the funder with the Smith Foundation's strategic goals to increase educational attainment, you're doing that, and then increase household financial stability, you're doing that as well. The Smith Foundation can become a strong partner with ABC to equip students who are graduating from local high schools with the skills to be self-sufficient. So you've got your need statement, your target market, your data, your stats, and you're aligning it back to the areas of interest to the foundation. And don't worry, there will be uh, a replay. I know this is a lot. So there will be a replay that will be sent out to you uh, since you registered. And so another part of the grant application is storytelling. This becomes really important because Grant writing, I tell you, it is all about telling a story. How are you going to tell your story better than anyone else? So it starts with a message. Who is my audience? What is the message I want to share with them? Again, I call it mining, mine your own experiences, because at the end of the day, you're a small business owner. The one thing that makes your company more unique than anyone else is you because no one can duplicate you. No one can bring the level of experience that you can, right? You are the key factor that makes your organization stand out. And you have to be able to write about this. So again, what events in your life make you believe in the idea that you're trying to share and the company that you may be starting to fund or maybe you're trying to expand? One thing to be sure about though, 
Don't make yourself the hero. Put the target population at the center of the story, not you. And so when we go back, let's go back a few slides to that example about the Beauty Academy. This was about what? This was really about what? Put into the chat who you think was the focus of this statement of need. And let's see what you come up with. Put into the chat who you think was the focus of this statement of need. Let's see what we have here. Exactly, yes, 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 yes. Absolutely, absolutely. It was the high school students. It wasn't the academy. It wasn't the beauty academy. It was the students because at the end of the day, you want to talk about where the transformation is going to occur. And let's go back to that bakery, right? You may think, well, okay, she makes some great cupcakes, but what's the transformation there? Well, perhaps the transformation is that business people have the opportunity to come on their lunchtime and taste the best cupcakes, you know, within a one mile radius, that that is an opportunity, right? But at the same time, who knows, maybe this was a recipe that was passed down from your grandmother, your great grandmother. So here's an opportunity to share a part of your history with your community, right? So there's many ways in which you can talk about, you know, what makes you unique uh, as you bring your product to, uh, to the public. So again, what is the transformation? So in an application, going back to that bakery, you're gonna talk about you know, how uh, you're serving the community and how the community now has this fabulous bakery that is going to cater to their needs. Wanna say just a few more things about the storytelling because it's so important. When you're telling your story, you really have to show, you know, how are you making a difference? How are you changing lives? How is your outcome achieved? You may have a service, uh, a service uh, industry instead of a product-based industry. You may be providing a service that, you know, teaches people how to become organized. Maybe you, maybe you write planners or you create planners. How are you changing their lives by the planners that you create and then sell to your audience? So your story should appeal to this human factor, you know, core values. You can focus on the benefits of your organization, but always look at your target market. And again, if you are creating these planners and people are, are getting their lives organized, right? You can use these real examples, testimonials, case studies, right? There should be this emotional connection. And there's no better way to tell your story other than video. And this is an easy way. No longer do you have to spend uh, lots of money on expensive equipment to produce videos. Ask one of your clients to take their Apple phone or their Android, I'm an Android person, take their Android and film a one minute, two minute testimonial about how their lives were changed or how you made their lives better based on whatever product you're providing, whether it's service oriented or an actual physical product. There should be some type of emotional connection. You should have, if you have a website, you should have testimonials absolutely on your website. On that home page, there should be testimonials. Maybe they're written or maybe you have videos. So incorporate videos into how you tell your story. I have worked with many nonprofits and I can and, and small businesses, and I can tell you when I set up that meeting with that program director of the foundation and we go in together and we're talking about the benefits of the organization and how we serve a community, nothing changes the atmosphere in that room like when we show a video of the actual result or the testimonials. It is amazing the transformation that people have when they can visually see you know, how you are helping the community or your client. So incorporate video. It can be a cheap way of really giving, getting you the results that you want. And so as a small business, you want to think about, am I going to be asking for grant money in the area of operating? expenses or program project expenses. It is really important to keep in mind that only 
about 32% of foundations or organizations provide general operating support to their grantees, right? So what's the difference? Operating support means you decide where you're gonna use the funds. You have this small business and let's say you're creating planners and you need software or you need staff or you need someone to write your Facebook ads for you. You decide where you wanna put grant money if you get operating grants. Or if you get program project grants, you have to decide where you are going to place some money within that particular program or project. And let's say, again, as a small business, let's say you have a restaurant. Let's say you wanna start a takeout business, right? Let's say you wanna start a delivery service. That's your project. So in program project funding, you have to apply the money to that specific program or project or service. Whereas with operating, you decide IT, staff, building, rent, salaries, which is why a lesser amount of foundations like to give operating money because they have less control over where it's going. In order to decide, you have to do an assessment of your business to decide where are your greatest needs. If you're starting up, maybe you need infrastructure, maybe you need IT, maybe you need you know, technology, maybe you need a building, maybe you need to pay for your rent space. So you have to consider where are your greatest needs or maybe you're already established. And again, you are that restaurant and you wanna start takeout service. You have to hire people to start a delivery service. That would be your, your project. Where, where are your greatest needs? Do an assessment of where you are now. And that will help you decide what to ask for. Now, there are some grants that only provide program project uh, funding and that's okay. But there are others that give you the choice. The other section of the grant is a description of your program project or service. Again, how and why has it been successful? These are some of the factors you wanna include. Why will it be successful if it's new? Address the need, okay? Of course, you're gonna put in details of your activities. If it's a new method, why will it work? What is the supporting research to make sure it's going to work? Maybe you have a new way of um, delivering food, right? You've done your research, how is it going to work? Again, how are you solving an issue or a problem or making it better? And the timeline is important, be realistic. If it's going to take you a year to completely implement whatever your service is or your product, say a year, don't say six months, don't shortchange yourself because the last thing you wanna do is not give yourself enough time. You wanna be realistic. Now, community partners is probably one of the most important components of an application. I cannot overstate its importance enough. And this is about partnering with other organizations. Now, as a small business, I hear a lot of people grumble like, oh, I don't, I don't really wanna partner or I don't have to give up a percentage of my ownership. That's not what partnerships are about. Partnerships could very well be your vendors. Who do you help? Who's providing you with additional services? So for example, if you are an organization, let's go back to that principal and she started her business and she's providing tutoring services for after school. Well, in Ohio, if you provide services after school hours, you have to provide food for the students. And so she could very well be partnering with the Cleveland Food Bank, right? Here in Cleveland, the Cleveland Food Bank provides free food. And so that's a community partner. It doesn't have to be someone that is in some type of a contract to get a portion of your funds, right? And so at one time I worked on a grant that was for a music program for third graders and it was to teach violin to third graders. And we were gonna work with the Cleveland Orchestra, which is you know, one of the greatest orchestras in the world. And they were to come after school and then teach and tutor violin, right? And so again, they were going to be considered a partner. So again, it doesn't have to be uh, a contract at all. 
These are just some of the ways in which you can partner. Universities, women's business organizations, Greek organizations, the, you know, the YWCA, the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club, are there women-owned businesses, right? You know, think about how you can partner with another organization, because I can tell you on grant applications now, this is going to be a component. There's no way of getting around it. You're going to have to address what are you doing, right, to partner with other organizations. And let's go back to that bakery, right? Maybe she's getting her menus from another woman-owned business, right? Maybe she's using a woman-owned business to print her menus. So this is these are some of the ways that you could talk about how you're partnering with other organizations. They can be third-party vendors. Outcomes, outputs, and impact, or rather outputs, outcomes, and impact. How do you know your service is working? How do you know your service is working? Your outputs, those are your immediate results. Your outcomes, these are the changes or activities as a result of the program or your service. So let's say the restaurant that wanted to start takeout, right? So the output would be, okay, they started takeout, they have the staff in place, they have the menus in place, they have their drivers, if, they, if, if it includes delivery, well, the outcome would be, what were the changes or activities as a result of you creating a delivery service or a takeout service? Could be increased sales, increased traffic, right? And what was the impact? Maybe because of that increased traffic and those increased sales, maybe in six months you were able to expand, right? Maybe you were able to add more menu items, onto the restaurant. So here's another example. The impact is all about the future changes as a result of the program. So outputs, outcomes, impact. There was a program that was going to train 100 prisoners before they were released from jail on a workforce development program. So six months before they were to be released, they were to be trained on this workforce development program. So at the end of the program, that was it, that was the output. They trained 100 prisoners on these soft job skills as a part of this work release program. Well, what happened as a result of those 100 prisoners being trained before they were released? Well, here's the outcome. You have 100 now ex-prisoners who can begin these workforce development programs within three months of their release. Because they had the pre-release training, they can now participate in additional training. And what happens as a result of the output and the outcome, what's the impact? The impact is that it reduced the recidivism rate of ex-offenders by 25% within one year of the release. And recidivism is the rate at which prisoners go back to jail. So because they had these soft skills now and they had this job training, there was a less chance of them going back to jail. And so when you input on your application, your output, your outcomes, your impact, keep in mind, this is what you want to have happen. Right, you are estimating that this is what is going to happen. So this is all what you're writing down as a way in which you are going to show that your program or your service is working. Another way to evaluate your outcomes, and a lot of grant applications will ask you this, are SMART goals. So many of you might've heard of SMART goals, they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And so you have to create goals that fit into SMART goals. And I'll give you an example. So here's like a regular goal. I want to reduce the poverty rate in Cleveland. Well, no, because that's a huge goal, right? You have to be specific. Let's turn that into a SMART goal. I want to reduce the poverty rate by 5% in Cleveland for Hispanic children under the age five within a five-year time frame. So we are specific, We're, we can measure it, 5% in Cleveland within a top five-year time frame. It's relevant, right? We know that there is a high poverty rate in Cleveland, it's timely. You've created a, a, a five-year time frame. So what you're doing, you're using figures and data and stats and numerical indicators. And what is another way to show your outcomes? Use assessment tools. And again, you're writing this into the grant application because you're going to be asked, well, how are you going to measure your outcomes? You want to put your SMART goals, 
And then you're gonna talk about your assessment tools. What are they? Surveys, reports, follow-up interviews. If you're that restaurant, you wanna have surveys about your service, about your food. Survey Monkey is a great survey uh, opportunity for you to use. And I believe Google has a free survey tool as well. So utilize your, your service and don't wait, right? Until you're at the end of your, of your service, right? You can, you can provide surveys all the way through the planning stages too. So this becomes important tools to help you evaluate and show, are I meeting my goals? Am I being successful? because you will be asked this information on many, many grant applications. Another portion of the application is your project program staff. And this is pretty straightforward. The only thing I wanna really mention is that when you're talking about the staff, make sure they're qualified. You wanna include their bios and their resumes, their areas of responsibility, because the grant funder wants to know, well, who are you putting in charge of this service or this project or this program? Oversight is key. So make sure you have their resumes and their bios and the numbers, right? Are you hiring six new people, 10 new people? Include the leadership, your board of directors list. That's important. Board of directors, they're more, they're for more than just selling, you know, fundraising tickets. You never know who they know and how they can connect to the funder. And here's a little known area that's very helpful. Opportunity for volunteerism for the funder. Funders love to be involved in the work of organizations. So think about ways in which there are opportunities and areas to volunteer for which the funder can participate. Now the budget. The one thing I wanna stress about the budget, you have to be able to itemize your expenses for each budget area. Don't just say I need $100,000 for salaries. What are the salaries going to pay? Is it for the executive director, staff, program personnel, your contractors, your administrative people, other staff people? Be specific. And are the costs reasonable? I mean, we know that the cost for certain salaries, for example, is different in California than it is in Ohio. So are your costs reasonable for the area, right, that you're functioning in? And you can use reliable sources for estimates. You can attach vendor quotes. And when you get to the budget narrative, you're talking about how you're using the funding. And I, I always like to connect the budget narrative back to the goal of the program. So if I'm writing, I need $20,000 to pay for a part-time project manager because they're going to help us implement the goals of the program. So I connect that money that's being used in the budget narrative back to the goal of the overall program. Sustainability, so this one is important. And this is all about, well, how do you stay afloat once the grant money is gone? And for small businesses, it becomes a little bit easier because most of the time you're in some type of revenue generating um, segment, right? You are already somehow generating maybe the the restaurant, their sales there, right? They're selling food. If you have a planner, maybe you've been selling planners, right? But this is all about how do you sustain that project, the product, the service after the money is gone? And so it's all about like writing alternative fund development methods into the application. So let's say as a small business owner, you want to start a school, right? You want, it's a for-profit school, you want to start a school and you're seeking money for, let's say, curriculum at the school. Well, once the funding is gone, because keep in mind that no funding is guaranteed unless they say this is a multi-year fund or multi-year grant, you, can't re you cannot rely on it the next year. So, Put some of the ways into the chat if you're a school that you can raise additional funds, talk about raising additional funds so that even when the grant is gone, you will have some level of support for whatever program or curriculum you decide to bring into the school. So put it to the chat some ways in which you can still receive or raise funding into the school 
even when the money is gone. Think about that, right? Can you do a fundraiser? Can you sell school merchandise? Can you have rallies? Exactly. Thank you, Robin. Uh, an annual gala is perfect, like fundraising, fundraisers, right? Candy, absolutely. Candy. That's a great, that's a great idea. Maybe school merchandise, right? Tickets to your school musical, shows, a golf tournament, right? Sell food at sporting events, sponsorships. So you have to get creative and think about ways in which you will continue to move forward even when the grant money is gone. And so now we've come to the point about really getting notice, right? Getting notice to get funded. We've gone through the components. We've talked about how you write them. Now, these are some of the ways in which you can really position yourself uh, against your co competition. So it's all about thinking about what you need to do before you write, before you write the grant. Position yourself for success. Show your uniqueness. And a lot of it is about you. Begins with you. You strategize first, okay? You make sure that you are choosing the correct funder. That is so important. Do your research. You want to gain partners, right? Look at those community partners that you're trying to gain. A lot of it is relationship building. And this is so important. I want to stop here and let you know it is crucial if you can at all meet with the funder first. I tell this story all the time. I was in a room with, with several foundation executives and I heard one of them say, if I have applications in front of me and this person has not called me, emailed, tried to talk with me, tried to, to start some level of communication, whether it's call me on the phone, email me, I'm not looking at that application. Application is probably going into the trash. Now that doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen with every foundation or every funder, but be aware it's up to you to reach out, to try to set up that meeting and communicate with the funder. There are some foundations that want no communication. They don't want you to call them. They don't want you to email them and that's okay. But you do your due diligence in trying to set up that meeting. Because at the end of the day, all things being equal, if I have a pool of applicants to the left and to the right and one to the, to the left, I've talked with them. I know their mission, their passion. We've, ha we've had a meeting. They've shown me a video of their work, of their testimonials. Who am I more inclined to give funding to? The organization that reached out and that I was able to learn more about their passion and more about what they do. So the relationship building is so, so, so important. It is absolutely critical. So again, how do you get noticed? Getting noticed to get funded. These are the documents that I talked about before. Make sure you have them ready. Again, if you're a nonprofit, your 501c3, your certificate of incorporation, bylaws, your list of board of directors, research models, your letters of support, your latest annual audit financial statement, if you have that, your current operating budget, right? That becomes important. Your list of any other funding sources. No funder wants to be the only one. So no, no funder wants to be funding uh, by, by themselves, right? And then your memorandum of understanding, that's just a document from your partner saying that, you're engaged, right, into providing whatever the service is. So when the Beauty Academy was working with the school, there was a letter of a memorandum by the school district to say, yes, we're working with this, with this Beauty Academy. We're going to be, you know, providing our students from our high school and, they're and the Beauty Academy will spend some hours within the school. So it's just a letter that talks about what that arrangement is going to actually look like. You don't always need one, but it's always best to have one. Now, again, before you write, what are you gonna ask for? General operating support or program project support, knowing that only 32% of foundations provide general operating support. 
These are some do's and don'ts. Do create a strategy, research, research, research your funder. Who and what have they funded before? Use that 990. Link the need to how you're going to use the funds. Think like the funder. At the end of the day, foundations have limited money. They can't give money to everyone. So they're gonna look at who's using their resources most effectively. Absolutely consider your time management, please, right? Deadline driven, grants are deadline driven. Make sure you address each and every question, right? That is important. And if you don't have an answer, if it doesn't pertain to you, never leave it blank. Because oftentimes when these grant applications go through online portals and they see a blank answer, they're going to mark it incomplete and your grant application will never have even been considered. So if you cannot address the question or it does not pertain to you, just put in NA, just put in NA. Do seek external reviews, please. Have someone else to review your application, please, before you submit it. Preferably someone with a mastery of the English language because you don't want those grammatical errors and make sure you are using Grammarly. Don't use cookie cutter answers based on a template and don't ask for too much when approaching a funder for the first time, this is critical. Now there are grants which will tell you how much the grant money is for and that's great. But if it doesn't tell you how much the grant money is for, you don't wanna go in the first time saying, okay, I'm a this woman on business, I need $100,000, that's what I'm gonna ask for. You don't wanna do that. I always recommend to start off low, be conservative, you know, anywhere between $5,000 to $20,000 is what I would ask for the first time because you're trying to get approved, you're trying to get your foot in the door so that the next year you can then ask for a large amount of money. You know, don't underestimate your time, start early. Don't wait until the last minute to submit. That is key. Don't forget to edit, use Grammarly.com. It is a free resource. Now, how are you going to introduce yourself to, let's say, your potential community partners, right? Use a letter of introduction. And in the letter of introduction, you, you can use this letter to not only introduce yourself to potential partners, but to introduce yourself to the funder or the foundation. So this is just a letter of introduction to try to get that first meeting. You want to include the description of your organization, the statement of need, your target population, what are you trying to improve or change or start or begin, how your service aligns to the funder, take it back to the mission. Don't ask for a dollar amount, not in the initial letter where you're just trying to meet with the organization. You will discuss that once you meet with them. And do your research again. Do your research and include the research into this letter and get a reference, right? Keep in mind 90% of foundations, they don't have a website. Maybe your board of directors can refer you to the right person. Whatever you do, don't send these letters to info at abcfoundation.org. Do your research, get a real person's email, get a real person's name. You're gonna find the name from the 990 and I'm giving you the teapot here. Let me tell you, I'm giving you a website that will allow you to get just about any person's email in the United States legally. It is www.getemail.il. And um, Erica, if you could put that into the chat for me. Um, it is absolutely amazing. OK, you can use this source, right? You can use this source to then get the emails that you need. So be sure if you're looking for your founders, utilize the getemail.io. Now, for you organizations, for your small businesses, you may be bidding on contracts as a small woman on business, right? And I also provide workshops for small businesses that provide this. So this is some of the information that I go over. So this is some of the uh, data that you're gonna put into your bid contract, your summary abstract, 
your mission vision, your history, your leadership, the description of your organization, your statement of need, which is your needs assessment or your target population. And here's where you're going to include the scope of work, your specific areas that you're going to provide, right? Based on the contract. What you want to keep in mind, which is so important, is that you never want to underbid. Some people think, well, if I'm bidding on a contract, let me just put the cheapest price in. That's such a huge red flag, such a huge red flag, because if I'm putting out a, a contract and it's to build a building, I'm going to know about what the average price is. So I'm going to know oh, it's going to take about a million dollars to put up that building. If I receive a contract bid from you that's saying it's only going to take $200,000, I'm going to know that you don't have capacity, that you don't have the capacity to actually create and build this building. So utilize the skills that you have and place reasonable bids when you're bidding on contracts as small business owners. And so this is some of the grant research. So I talked before about choosing the perfect funder. And so as women-owned businesses, when you're doing your grant research, you can specify in your search whether or not they specifically fund women-owned businesses. These are some of the major grant engine uh, search portals that you can use. And so these portals will allow you to search for funders and foundations. The largest and the leading source is the foundation directory online. And that cost is about $50 a month. You can get an annual subscription, but it's about $50 a month. Again, this is your grant research that you're gonna do to match up what you believe in your mission, your product with the perfect funder. Instrumental.com is another grant search engine. They're, they're pretty pricey. They're about $170 a month. Now, if you're looking for federal grants, absolutely grants.gov. That's the single source of federal grants. Over 900 grant programs from 26 agencies. If you are a faith-based organization, the Lilly Foundation, that's the largest funder of religious organizations. Maybe your small business deals with education. GrantGopher.com focuses on educational grants. I like GrantWatch.com because they have so many last minute grants. If you're a minority organization, right? A minority uh, and woman owned business, I highly advise you to sign up to Urban Amer I'm sorry, UrbanAwarenessUSA.org. And it's free. Now they do have certain levels of services that you can get, but their basic program where they are providing you with information on grants, free urbanawarenessusa.org. I skipped one. All right. So again, this grant research is for your smaller businesses. Now, as a woman-owned business, you must, you absolutely must know about helloalice.com because they, right now, they're the leading source of grants for women-owned businesses. They're free for now. They're free because from what I understand, they're getting ready to, to go to a subscription model. Right now, they're free. HelloAlice.com. Also, the Facebook Black Creators, if you are a minority uh, woman-owned business, you need to know about Facebook's Black Creators Grant. Amber Grants for Women. They give away a grant every single month. They give away multiple grants every single month just for women-owned businesses. There's the National Association for the Self-Employed Growth Grants. You wanna know about NASE. If you're a minority-owned business, Minority Business Development Agency, business grants. There's a FedEx Small Business Grant. Again, if you're interested in government grants, there's a Small Business Innovation Research Grant, uh, the SBIR. So these are just a few small business grant research portals. And these are two particular areas that are so, uh, so important. Banks and workforce development. 
So let me ask you, when you think about banks and funding, what do you think about? Put in the chat, what do you think about when you think about banks and funding? Let's see what we have here. Loans, loans, money, loans, right? Interest, absolutely interest. That's typically what we think about, loans and interest. Expensive, yes, credit history, loans, have to apply for loans, red tape, absolutely, Amy, paperwork. But there you go, Melanie Lester said it. Community giving, community giving. Did you know that banks are one of the largest providers of grants to small businesses? You just need to know where to go and who to ask, right? You're not going to the grant manager because typically you're going to the grant manager when you want a loan. But almost every bank has a vice president of either community development or community resources. You find out who that person is at the bank and you meet with them and you talk to them about providing grants to your woman-owned business. I have been able to get grant money from banks for women-owned businesses because at the end of the day, banks are embedded in their community. And you as a woman-owned business, you're providing for that community. You're generating income in that community. And so banks is really, when you think about it, a natural connection there. So don't think about banks as just a source of loans. They give billions of dollars a year and grant money. Again, look for your vice president of either community development, community affairs. Uh, usually the title is someone in that area or similar and meet with them and let them know, I'm, I'm a woman on business. I wanna apply for a grant. The other area is workforce development. And too many of you don't think that you're in workforce development, but as a small woman on business, if you are providing any type of jobs, whether it's W-2 employees or independent contractors, you're creating jobs. And so, yes, you can apply for workforce development programs and, and grants because that's what you're doing with your small business. So don't skip over the idea of banks in your community and don't think you have to think outside of the box. If you're creating various jobs, you are absolutely contributing to the welfare and the growth of that community. You are in workforce development. So those are two areas to keep in mind. All right, and next we have women-owned um, businesses that I want you to be absolutely aware of. Now I belong, I am so proud to belong to the Women Helping Women Entrepreneurs Facebook group and stay until the end because I have a special surprise and a special discount uh, for you because I know there are tons of women on the um, online here that are from the Women Helping Women Entrepreneurs. So give yourself a shout out. If you belong to the Women Helping Women Entrepreneurs, it was, it's a Facebook group founded by Christina Rowe and there's over a half a million women in this Facebook group. Again, there's over a half a million women in this Facebook group. So if you are, yes, that's where I found you. Thank you, yes. So there are women, there's lots of women on the line that are part of the Women Helping Women Entrepreneurs. So if you do, do not know about this Facebook group, please, 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 please go to Facebook and sign up to be a part of this community of literally women who help other women entrepreneurs. I cannot tell you the resources that I have gained personally for my business by being a member of this group. They just phenomenal, phenomenal group of women, a half a million women, right? Over 500,000 women belong to this Facebook group. Another organization, which is fantastic, is the National Association of Women Business Owners. So NAWBO, make sure you find out whether or not there is a chapter in your city. It's all about sisterhood, all about women entrepreneurs. They provide resources, they provide training, they provide meetups. Make sure uh, you check them out and see if there's a chapter near you. There's the American Business Women's Association. Make sure you go to that site and sign up for membership. There's the Female Entrepreneur Association, right? I think there's a wait list now 
um, to get in, but go check out their website. And there is the Small Business Administration's Office of Women's Business Ownership. Did you know that existed? How many of you knew that existed? that as a part of the US Small Business Administration, there is the Office of Women's Business Ownership. Again, for all kinds of resources that would be available to you. Some of you may have heard of Ladies Who Lunch, okay? That is a fantastic um, organization. And then I know in Ohio, we have the Women's Business Centers of Ohio. So check out in your state whether or not there's a Women's Business Center in your particular area. So these are just really some of the opportunities for you to be able to network and networking is so important as women business owners. You wanna be able to share your skills and be able to find out who has resources that's going to be beneficial to you. Again, um, I have been able to um, hire people from some of these organizations that I'm members of and they've just been a wonderful source of support. So definitely check them out. And you know, commit, commit to joining at least one of them, you know, on on this group. And so, uh, again, the women helping women entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, that's free. There, there, it doesn't cost to join um, that Facebook group. And so, thank you so much for staying to the end. I have such a bonus surprise for you. So don't go anywhere. As I mentioned, I have been writing grants for literally almost fourteen years. I've written and secured right. $17 million worth of grants and funding development. And I give these webinars to be able to help you to make sure that you have the resources that you need to fund your organization. And so I am just, I am so thrilled to have started my grant writing course. So I wrote a grant writing course, grant writing for non-writers, right? Because this is not for professional writers. Anyone with the right information and the right tools and the right learning and teaching can write winning grants. So it's grant writing for non-writers, keys to winning grant proposals. And so that course really provides you with this step-by-step -step path to funding. It is a wonderful community of students that help each other out. And it's really about, do you wanna save significant money on grant writing expenses? I said before to hire a professional grant writer a proven grant writer is anywhere between 100 to $200 an hour. It can be really pricey, but I want you to place yourself right in a positive position and have an advantage to be able to secure a $20,000 grant, a $30,000 grant, a $50,000 grant or more. Like what could you do in your business right now if you want a $30,000 grant? Those grants are available all the time through just some of the resources that I gave you, but it's about being able to write so that you showcase yourself above any and everyone else. So the course includes 12 modules, 35 lessons, 30 introductory videos, right? Everybody learns differently, right? So every lesson starts with a video where I'm talking, but it doesn't end there. And I hear from people that say, oh, is it just like uh, a course full of videos? Absolutely not. That's just the beginning. You have the video, you have the written lesson, because again, people learn differently. Some people are visual learners, some people need to read narrative. So you have the lesson that you can print out, you have the workbook, but here is the thing. You have actual winning grant examples. So if I'm asking you to really write about your target market, you have an example of a winning grant that I have written, every example I wrote that I have written, that showcases how you talk about your target market so that you can emulate what it looks like and, and how you can share your story. So you have the videos, you have the 12 modules, you have the grant examples, you have how to write every part of the narrative. We only touch the, the uh, really the surface here. I have a lesson on basic writing. I have a lesson on storytelling. The letter of inquiry we didn't even talk about sometimes a funder doesn't want a full grant application. They just want a letter of inquiry, which is usually one to two pages. I have real examples of complete letters of inquiry in the course. It's really how to approach funders and partners. We talked about that. How do you approach them, right? What, what does it look like? 
What does the letter look like? What should you be saying? What do you do before you even apply? There's really a process to get yourself in the best position. So you have your lesson task, you have your printables, you have your quizzes. I teach you about the grant research because again, you need to be able to approach the right funder. And that's about using some of those search engine portals that I talked about to find out who is the right funder for you. And this is, this I have to say is incredible. So once you go through the course, at the end of the course, you should have written a template for your organization, right? So you're ready, you're ready. You have your grant portal where you can find your funder, but I take it one step further. I literally give you a list of over 400 funders. You have everything you need. And these funders range everything from education funders to uh, entrepreneurs who, um, funders who provide for entrepreneurs, funders who provide for small businesses. You have those 400 funders, so you're ready, right? but I know that you need support. And I know there are some other courses where you take the course and then there's no support. You know, people are kind of left hanging. Where you have a private Facebook group where you come in, you ask questions about the course. Let's say you find a grant and there's a question that you really, you're not sure how to answer it. Come into the Facebook and, and, and ask the question, right? So we have that available for you. There's also, you get one, hour of group coaching every single month. So once again, you may be stuck, you may have questions, come into the group coaching session, ask your questions. This is a community, right? It's a community of students who want to be able to fund their organization. You will not be alone. So the 12 modules and the 35 lessons with the videos, that's $3,549 worth 35.49 to 30. Videos worth $5.99, the 400 funders, right? If you paid me to give you that list, it's a $500 charge. I give you planners that include your goal planner and your grant tracker. So when you start applying for grants, you can track the progress, progress, excuse me, who have I applied to? Have I received any notification? That's all included. But here's the best part of all. So the course is $997. You get a $49.97 value. It's valued at $5,000, but it's $997. But please, this is critical. For Women's History Month, I reduced the course to $497. Again, so for Women's History Month, I reduced the course to $497, 50% off. But because my Women Helping Women are on the line, I'm giving a special code, a WHW 300 off code that will literally, for the next three days only, take $300 off of not the 997, the 497 payment. So you can get this course that on April 2nd, once we go through the three days, we'll be back up to 997. You can get it for 197. That's not 197 a month. That's one payment of 197. You have to use the coupon code because if you go into the portal, it will say the course is 497. That's what I reduced it to for Women's History Month. But I'm giving you a special women helping women code where you can input the code for the next three days only and take an additional $300 off of the 497. That's a crazy price. I completely revamped and revised the course. There's quizzes, there's so much that you get. And if you know anything about courses, when you do that and you reintroduce it, oftentimes you provide it at um, a really fantastic price. So that's what you're getting for three days. You're getting a 197 price for three days. It will go back up to 997. So this is it for the next three days. Use the code. WHW 300 OFF. And I really want to be able to see you in the course. So this is what you get. The deadline is April 1st. You get literally the 12 modules, the 35 lessons. The list now is over 400 funders. All of the application work teaching you how to write every component. The private Facebook group is a self-paced course. Once you pay, once you pay, you can start immediately. And that's what you need to know. 
It is a self-paced course. I know with some university courses, you get what, a month or three months, or you're sitting there for five days and after the course is done, that's it. You will have this course forever. No expiration date, it's self-paced. And for the Women Helping Women Code, it will take $300 off. Again, it's just for three days only. So I don't want you, you all to be mad at me on April 2nd when you go in and it's 997. It's only gonna be 197 literally for the next three days. And the first group coaching session starts April 11th at 7 p.m. So I want everyone to really take advantage of this and place in your own hands the opportunity to start securing grants, stop bootstrapping, start securing grants. The money is out there. It's available. And yes, I've written grants for my own woman, woman owned business. The grant money is out there. So the first group coaching session is April 11th, where I want you to come in. I do a, an orientation for the course, but you don't have to wait because you get to start right away. So you can pay $197 literally and be able to write, you know, $10,000, $50,000, $100,000 or more in grants. And this is on a regular basis. And most of you may know, or some of you may know, that in order to file that regular 990 form, you need to have income of at least $50,000. So this is a great way to learn how to write a grant, get your $50,000 and be able to, to submit a regular 990 form to your funder. And so these are just some of the testimonials. I invested in this program recently. It is amazing. Linda Peavy is a master grant writing guru that came from Kim. Carla says, I am so glad I signed up for the course. It is straightforward and very easy to understand. It really is. It's chock full of information. Thank you for this, Linda. Paulina says, I would like to thank you for this page in the course. The course was easy to read, listen to, and understand. I've already signed up for notifications from Hello Alice, and the information I've received is very helpful. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. And then Alinda says, Ms. Peavy, what a great idea to become a grant service provider. She is actually becoming, she has become now a grant writer. She wanted to take the course to become a grant writer, and she's been able to do that. So again, you can um, enroll at the URL that's placed into the chat. And I just want to make sure everyone can still see me and hear me. Okay, great. All right. So we are going to the Q and A. I am going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. And so we are going to start the Q and A and I am going to start in the Q and A section because I wanna make sure I answer every question. So please, I want you to, you know, definitely, definitely, um, Get the course and join us and really start taking into your own hands the opportunity to fund your organization. So here's a question. Does 501c3 have to be, have to have audit financial statements or just bank statements? So you don't need an audit financial statement to complete your 501c3. No, you don't. What if you're just starting off and don't have financial audit? That is fine. You don't need a financial audit statement if you're just starting off. If your nonprofit is based on helping others, how does it have a history? I explained that right into the, I explained that while I was giving the webinar, talk about the history of you wanting to start it. What was the impetus of you wanting to start the organization? That's part of the history too. What if you're helping mental health, seniors, children, veterans, abuse, how do we target them? So what is your main area that you're helping, right? Is it, it sounds like it's in the area of mental health. So that's your main category. So when you do your grant search, search under mental health. However, you can search under different options. So you can have one grant search where you're searching for funders who have provided money for mental health providers, but you can also do another search where you're looking at providing funding for people who help children or for organizations that help veterans. So you have the opportunity for doing multiple searches. It doesn't have to be limited to just one. 
What are you looking for when looking at the uh, Secretary of State site? I can find my business and the information attached. What else do we? Well, that's it. So if you find your, if you can find your business and it says that you currently have an active certification within the Secretary of State, you can actually print that out, but that's all you need. If you can find your business and it's currently active, you're good. Are still pictures good or videos only? I, I'm always going to recommend videos, always, over still pictures. You can do both. You can have the still pictures, but have someone also, if, if at all possible, film even a short video. What if your organization's main focus is giving fundraisers? How do we get funding for such a program? That's interesting because many grants that I look at do not give for fundraisers. So they won't give for a fundraiser, but it's okay if your organization is focused on giving fundraisers and that's what your service is, then that's fine. It's just that many grantors won't give money as part of a fundraiser. But if that's the service you provide, then that's fine. We'd love to partner with universities, colleges, local and globally to provide healthcare uniforms. That's great. And accessories at an affordable price. So can students, so students can focus on their, that's great and not in the cost of the uniforms. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a fantastic uh, opportunity to partner with your local universities. Do you have to write a grant for each funder? Absolutely you do. However, for example, when you go through this course that I'm offering, you will have a really good template because you're gonna be answering all of the questions based on your organization. So you'll, you'll be able to do a lot less work when you're actually applying for the grants because you have a great template, but you still need to tweak it because again, every application is different. So you have to make sure that you are answering the question. Okay, that is important. That is important. Answering the question based on that specific application. If you are a startup in real estate investing, if you are a startup in real estate investing company looking to invest in a revitalization of a neighborhood, would applying for an operating grant be the best? If you are just starting out, I would say, you know, absolutely look to apply for an operating grant, but that doesn't have to be your only source, your sole source, but that would be a good start. Are there courses you recommend to take for grant proposal writing where we can earn a certificate? So you will get a certificate after you finish this grant writing course. This is um, not for non, this is not for nonprofit, but for a small business. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure what the question there is actually. My mission is to help in the recovery of trauma survivors, help women get unstuck after physical, mental, and sexual abuse or loss of a child to suicide, overdose, or drunk driver. Is it better to create a partnership with nonprofits with a similar mission who are failing? That's where I would come in to the partnership. These nonprofits only score two out of four on Charity Navigator. So that's a really, really, really great question because absolutely you could go in, if that's your specialty, you could go in and partner with an organization to provide that piece of their mission, to provide, to provide excuse me, that piece of their program. So that would, be, that would be a fantastic partnership or financially better to pitch, to create a pitch for corporate sponsorships to host seminars, courses, retreats, and events that will fulfill the ultimate mission. Why not do both? or figure out how to get government grants, that's going to be your most difficult. Getting government grants are extremely, extremely difficult. You really need to be in business for a number of years to have a proven concept, to have uh, revenue. I would say go for one and two. Why not do one and two? What do, what do I need from the Secretary of State to get the type of certificate to obtain government funding? Well, you need, your, you need your certificate from the Secretary of State to show that you're in good standing. So it shows that you're legally allowed to do business in your state and everyone will need that. How is grant writing different from a pitch deck or crowdfunding or a corporate sponsorship proposal? They're very different. So a pitch deck can be 
uh, something on a PowerPoint presentation that's really quick. Grant writing, you're specifically addressing questions. That's very different than a corporate sponsorship proposal where you're doing almost an outline on a, on a sponsorship proposal. But grant writing, you're addressing specific questions. That is a different proposal altogether. So those are, those are three very different things. Crowdfunding is where you're literally seeking money from, it could be from strangers, it could be from people you know. Typically you use some type of a platform like GoFundMe for crowdfunding. That's very different. Is there a difference between a 501c3 IRS tax letter and an insurance letter? They're totally and completely different. So if you're a nonprofit, you need a 501c3. Letters of support, I am a startup for-profit business. Who should I get a letter of support from? Would snippets of Google reviews be sufficient? No, I would, I mean, you can. You can use Google reviews, but why not ask someone who knows your history? Maybe you had another business before this startup business. You could ask someone who knows your history of being a business person to write letters of support for you. You don't need to already be in your new business. Or maybe this is your first time creating a, a for-profit business, right? But what did you do before? Maybe you know people who can write you a letter of support just based on your character. Is grant writing a numbers game? Is there a drawback to applying to multiple grants? No, grant writing is not a numbers game. Get, grant writing is being able to use skill in your grant writing, establishing your relationships, establishing partnerships. You can submit a hundred applications if they're not written correctly, right? If you don't match your mission with the mission of the funder, if there's not a connection there, there are so many factors that go into whether or not a grant is, is approved, but it's not a numbers game. Don't believe it's a numbers game. Create the relationships, right? Because if you create the relationships and you write the grant proposal adequately and you get the grant, that's something that you can go back to. And grants, now, something I do want to address that I thought about in your question. Let's say that you only need $100,000 and you have five grants, you know, $100,000, you have five grant applications. Each one, right, is for $20,000, right? Or let's say, I'm sorry, let's say you only need, let's say you only need $50,000. And you have five grant applications, each, each application is worth $20,000. So you have $100,000 worth of grant applications, but you only need 50,000. What do you do? Do you only apply to two or three? No, you always apply to all of them. You always apply to all of the grant application because you don't know if you're gonna get one. But let's say you got them all. Let's say, oh my gosh, you got the $100,000, but you only asked for 50. Never give any money back. Just expand upon what you're doing. So if you ask for $20,000 to hire a staff person, and you know you got additional money and that's what you asked for on all of the grant applications, hire two staff people. Use the money to expand on the exact ask that you put into the application. Who answers the questions in the private Facebook group? The other students. So there are students in there, there's professional grant writers in there and I'm in there as well. So more than likely I'm always in there looking at who's, who's asking questions and if I, if I'm available, I will ask questions as well. But it's a great community because, you know, some people will say, oh, I've written part of an application. I really need for it to be uh, looked at and reviewed. They can put it in there and other students will review it. Again, we have professional grant writers in there or just give them feedback or advice. Are, are there grants for real estate um, development? I mean, certainly there are. It's all about definitely doing the research. If I'm wanting uh, to start an Italian bakery, look for Italian American funders. No, no, not necessarily. No, because if you're starting a bakery, you could look for someone who's wanting to fund uh, a, start, a startup in the food industry, right? You don't have to necessarily look for Italian American funders. How do we start talking to community businesses? 
and do we offer their staff a discount? I own preschool centers. So how do we, so I talked a little bit about the letter of introduction that you can use in the webinar to send out to potential partners uh, to start to meet, to then start talking about, well, how are we going to partner? And it's up to you as to whether or not you want to provide a discount or what you want that partnership to look like. Like that's in your hands. So if you wanna offer a discount to them based on what service they're providing to you, you can certainly barter and work that out. Do they have funders for senior daycare and wellness? They absolutely do. There are lots of funders in the area of the elderly. I can assure you of that. I have a restaurant and we cater to customers with food allergies. This is my passion being a mom of kids with food allergies. What would I look for? I also own a small grocery store. So you're going to have a restaurant. You're going to look for funders who provide money in the food industry, right? That's one possibility. This also, this almost crosses a little bit into the medical industry. So you want to also, you want to broaden your research a bit, right? Because now you're dealing with maybe people with medical issues. So you might want to look there. It's really good to be able to broaden your, your grant search area so that you're looking for more than one type of funder. I'm currently a one person business, very new. How do I post questions about boards and employees? I would like to hopefully open a fully woman-run business in a very, excuse me, in a very uh, male-dominated field, helping organizations reduce plastic. Well, I deter funders by saying this. I'm not sure uh, what you mean when you say, will I defer, will I deter funders? I don't think you have to, it, de it, it depends on the funder. So for example, if it's a funder that specifically wants to fund a woman run business, th there are funds, right? There are grants that will give money to women, literally who are in industries that are predominantly male run. So that's where you have to do your research. So depending on the funder, they may be looking for that, right? They may be looking for you to say, okay, I work in an area that is predominantly uh, run by men. That, that may be very attractive to some funders. Well, funders fund your nonprofit that does fundraisers and charities to help other nonprofits and their goals. No, not, not if that's your service. They're not going to give to the fundraiser, but that doesn't mean they won't give to your nonprofit. Do you think now that I do not need your grant writing course, if per your suggestion, I should focus on affiliating with nonprofits and corporate sponsors and not government grants. Um, or does your course help with the proposals and pitches? My course helps with everything, the proposals, the pitches, it doesn't matter. My course is not focused on you just getting government grants, but any type of grants, local grants, foundation grants, um, private grants, what you need to know to write a grant period is in the course. Everything is in the course that you need to know to write a grant, regardless of whether or not you're pitching to a government grant or a local foundation. And also the writing, being able to tell your story is gonna help you whether or not you're completing a sponsorship application or a grant application. Someone talked about pitch decks, right? You still have to be able to tell your story. And so the course will help you tell the story. Is it acceptable to bring samples of the product? Oh, absolutely, sure. Sure, they'll be interested in that a dessert caterer. If not you, do you have any? If not you, do you have any referrals or suggestions on how to create a good pitch or proposal? That is written, that is provided for you in the course. Oh, I bought the course, yay. I have a jigsaw puzzle company, all creative and manufacturing in-house, trying to figure out the problem solution area. Right, so that's a good one. So your jigsaw puzzle, think about why did you create it? Why did you create the jigsaw puzzle company? Was it so that people would have something to do in their downtime, right? Are you trying to give people creative ways to? to keep their minds stimulated during their downtime. So what would be the issue there that you, that you want people uh, to be able to relax and focus on something that is pleasing to them? 
So we, we are in this crazy world, right? Where it's just, we're running 24 seven. Here's an opportunity for your company to provide something that's gonna be a benefit to someone, right? That would allow them a certain amount of calm so that maybe once they go to work, they can be rejuvenated because they were able to focus on, you know, this very calming, um, calming entertainment. So there, there's lots of ways in which you can think about the problem and solution, but go back to why you started it. Like, what was the impetus for you starting your jigsaw puzzle? And welcome to the community. You will absolutely love it because it's just great. We work together. We're very supportive of each other. I do your course help with all kinds of grants for a business? Yes, it does. Our daughter has a printing company and she needed something not even related during COVID. Yeah, so once you search for grants, there are literally... Mill, there's billions of dollars worth of grants available. Use the search engine, use the search engine. I've been working on my nonprofit for three years and just last year I got a building. So, I, uh, so I'm, but however, I've been applying for grants that have been unsuccessful at getting funding. I even took a paid grant writing class since I haven't been able to get grants. I'm uh, running out of money to stay afloat. If I send you over my proposal, could you take a look at it? Maybe I'm not writing it correctly. So once you purchase the course, come to the Facebook group and you can submit pieces of your proposal. We provide grant reviews for a cost. So once you go to the page where you buy the course, you can get a 50% discount on grant reviews. Our typical grant review is $1,500, but if you buy the course, you get a 50% off discount. We can review the proposal up to a certain number of pages for $750. So once you buy the course, we will be happy to review your proposal. However, you can go into the Facebook group, right? And provide pieces of your proposal for free and have people look at it for free and give you help. And again, I'm also in the Facebook group. So sometimes I'm in there looking at what people put in as well. All right, so let's just, this program is for nonprofits. Absolutely, it is for, it's for nonprofits. It's for for-profits, uh, for, for small businesses. It's about learning to write your story. All right, so let, let me just go back up. I'm done with the uh, Q&A. And the question and answer, let me just go back up. So what I want you to do is really be excited, right? Because this is your chance literally to get a $5,000 course for $197. And I want you to take advantage of it because it's going away. And in three days, it'll be back up to 997. And I don't, like, I don't want you to be mad at me, right? <laughs> when you go in there Friday and it's 997. Um, you can get it for the next three days. This is my Women Helping Women extra discount code because like I said, the course has been $4.97 for the month of March because I reduced it for Women's History Month. But use your $300 off coupon and get it for $1.97 for three days only, for three days only. And it is a community. It's a community of students. We help each other. Let me run back up to the top and just make sure... Okay, I'm, I'm answering the questions. All right. So you will get a copy of the webinar. Absolutely, you will get a copy of the webinar. Oh, and someone said, Robin Robin just said, a women's a business center just opened up in the Greenwood district of Tulsa, yes. Definitely connect with your women business centers because they have grants too. Many of them have grants too. Oh, good. Just join that Facebook group. Yes, the Women Helping Women Entrepreneurs. It is, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It is fantastic. Can we get something to print out on this webinar? Uh, you will get, we, we don't offer printouts, but you will get the webinar. You will get a replay of the webinar. Can we hire you to help us and pay you through the grant money we receive? That's actually uh, in, most, in most states that is illegal. I'm very glad you asked that question because you cannot pay a professional grant writer based out of the proceeds that you get. 
when you win the grant. One, no grant is guaranteed. So this person has done all this work for you. What if you don't get the grant? How are they paid? We are a skilled profession. And in most states, it is illegal to pay your grant writer out of grant proceeds because that is not what the grant money is for. Most grant applications state you are not to pay your grant writer out of the proceeds of the grant. So unfortunately, no. Oh, great. Thank you, Anita. She says for Idaho women, she put in a idahowomen.org. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Can you earn a certificate through your course? You will get a certificate saying that you've completed the course when you complete it. It's not a CFRE course where you can use for credits. I want to make that clear. It's not a course where you can use for credits, but yes, you will get a certificate saying that you completed this grant writing course that you can certainly you know, place on your resume or anywhere else. Do you have unlimited access to these videos or is it a certain time only? No, you have unlimited access to the entire course. The course is not just videos. I wanna explain that again. It's the video, the lesson, printouts, right? your list of 400 funders, all of your grant examples so that you know exactly what you're writing and how it should look. All of that information is to you forever. You have lifetime access to the course. Thank you, uh, Erica, for putting in the link. And oh, great, the Women's Business Development Council in Connecticut. Thank you everyone so much for including this additional information, absolutely. So the code, again, get your $300, it'll bring it down to 197. It's a crazy price, but again, I am re-launching um, it with, it's better than ever. And typically, like I say, if you know anything about courses, during that small window when you relaunch something is really, really low. That's why it's going back up to 997. So please, please get it now, please get it now. Um, oh, good. I am in. Thank you, Kathy. All right, Melanie. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Absolutely. Sign up, join, join. You can start immediately, people. Once you pay, you go into the portal, you sign up, you get your password, you get your account, and you start. Come to our group on, you can enter the Facebook group. Once you pay, you will receive admission to the Facebook group, but the the live group coaching session is free every single month. Come with your questions. Come to the group. The next one is April 11th, Monday, April 11th at 7 p.m. And even those are recorded. So there's even a replay to the free group coaching. All right, Robin is in. Yes, all right. And I can't tell if that's Georgia or George, but done, yes. Yes, absolutely. Do you help with capital campaigns and matching grants? So that just depends on what the grant is. So some grants are matching grants only, which means you have to be able to match the amount that you're that you want. So if you won twenty thousand dollars, you have to have another twenty thousand dollars to match that amount. So that just depends on the grant, really. All right. Um, I missed the last page. Don't worry about it. You'll get the replay. You'll get the replay. All right. All right, Lillian, thank you for signing up. This is, I want this to be a community, right? This is a community for everyone to come in and really be serious, right? I mean, this is a $5,000 course. It is a five, I've had it audited three times. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. People who know me know I'm a, I'm a perfectionist. I've had the course audited three times to make sure it includes everything you need. And the value is $5,000. And I, I price it at $9.97. So that is affordable uh, for people. But again, for Women History Month, I did something a little different. I did something special. And I put it at half off. But I knew that there would be a lot of people coming into the group from the Women Helping Women Entrepreneurs. And so I thought I needed to do something extra special uh, to celebrate them. But everybody gets the benefit of it because that's the $300 off. So you're getting this $5,000 course for $197 and you're just not going to be able to beat it. There are university courses out there that you can take for sure. Again, they're one day, three days, five days, and it's over. It's over, right? You have this course forever. 
videos, print printouts, downloadables, the funders list. If you hired me to give you a funders list is $500, you get it included. So it's a, it's a crazy value. The program is absolutely for not, it's for nonprofits and, and uh, small businesses. Absolutely. Yes, Paula, you're right. Join the Chamber of Commerce or your local networking group. That's a fantastic, fantastic opportunity. So uh, domestic violence and drugs help. Um, I don't know if I read that question, but if that's the area that you are in, I can tell you that there is more grant money available now than there has ever been in the area of drug help, specifically because of the opioid crisis. Absolutely. So that is an area where uh, there is grant funding absolutely available. I have a home daycare now who wants to expand the daycare with the youth center. Should I have the youth center as a 501? That's really up to you. If you want a for one to be a for profit and one to be a nonprofit, um, there are for profits that start nonprofits. So your for profit can actually have an arm that is a nonprofit. And Leslie says for jigsaw puzzles, they are good for assisted living facilities. Perfect, absolutely. You see how this is really a community? So when you, when you join and you are a part of our community of students who are getting grants for their organizations, you help each other. For example, on my free group coaching uh, call that I have once a month, I absolutely ask you to talk about your organization in the chat and join with someone else. And a couple of financial organizations did that. So it's about helping each other out and really networking because you, I can't say this enough. You do not have to do this alone. You don't have to leave this webinar and say, where am I going now? What am I supposed to be doing? I don't know what to do. This will take you step by step to provide grants for you. So that's an excellent idea for the jigsaw puzzles. Absolutely excellent. Oh, there's one, um, there's a women's center in Charlotte. Excellent. Are there funders who will fund an in-home licensed child care provider? I have found the resource and referral agencies in my county concern themselves with how much providers make versus preschool teachers. They can refuse to give children to you even when you have space. Can they be? I don't know. That's a very specific question. I'm not familiar with the child care situation in your particular um, state. I just, I really would not be able to answer that question. I would say start meeting with organizations in your state to find out, you know, what their policies are. Oh, uh, Leanna, is that it? Leanna, thank you so much. Leanna has become part of our community. Why am I not seeing where to put the code in? So when you go to put the code in, it will ask you, do you have a code? This is important. It will say, do you have a code? Just click, do you have a code? And then put in the code. So it, it will not pop up until you click the little um, area that says, do you have a code? You click that and then a box will drop down where you put in the code and then it should take the $300 off immediately so if you make a mistake, right, and you pay the $497, let us know after I'm done and we will credit you the amount immediately, immediately. So don't worry. But yes, click the section that asks you, do you have a code? Okay. All right. Um, okay. Just found it. Uh, it didn't show on the phone. Is the course good for grant writing all states? So, I mean, absolutely. It doesn't matter what state you're in. You use the information to help you write your story. It doesn't matter what state you're in. And the grant search portals that you're going to purchase, we, let me just uh, share something real quickly. In our grant, our free grant group coaching session that was a couple of, I think maybe a couple of weeks ago, I did a live, um, a live preview of how you work in the, in the grant search portals. And so one of the nonprofits who bought the course 
um, ha I had him raise his hand and he came up and he talked about his core, his, uh, his organization. And so I literally went into grantwatch.com and I put in his organization, all of the information, what he was looking for, where he was looking for a funder. And he literally served, he was based here in the US, but he was serving children in Africa. So even though his nonprofit was here in the US, his client base was not. And so we put in that information, we came up with over 200 funders, over 200 funders. It does not matter what state you're in. So that concludes the questions and the uh, chat. And I think I've answered everything and the question and answer. I would just ask everyone to, um, you know, definitely consider, consider investing this in your opportunity. You're trying to find yourself free money, right? You're trying to get free money. Invest a little bit of money to try to get free money. And this is one of the best investments I, I know that you will make. Uh, again, it's a $5,000 course. I know grant writers like me charge up definitely in between $100 to $200 per hour to write grants. So this is based on my, you know, 14 years of writing grants and it's step by step. You read the testimonies. It's piece by piece. We take you step by step. Um, so definitely, definitely, definitely um, sign up. If you have registered, which you have, you're online, you will get information about upcoming webinars. Absolutely, you will. There is one coming up that is geared towards um, Black-owned businesses and Black-owned nonprofits is coming up, but you will get that information. Um, you're a part of the system now, so you will get information on any, um, any future or upcoming webinars that we have. So I think I answered everything, definitely. Um, oh, and Ginger made a really good point. If you are a business, you can write this off, right? You're small owned businesses. This is educational learning. This is, I'm so glad, thank you. I'm so glad you mentioned that. You can write it off, right? So, hello, it's $197. You can write it off as a general business expense because this is education, right? So there you go. There you go, write it off, pay it and write it off as an expense, all right? So definitely, I want to see you for sure. I want to see you in the course. I mean, really um, take this opportunity to move yourself forward uh, so that you can get grant money and, 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 and not bootstrap and not have to worry about how am I going to fund my organization, right? There, there's a process. I talked about that at the beginning. There's a process. So you will receive the replay, absolutely. Three days. You have three days to use the coupon, okay? Just three days. So please, please, please use it. And I will see everyone who joins on April 11th. I provide personally the group coaching session. So you'll see me in there Monday night, April 11th. Come with your questions, introduce your non, your whether it's a nonprofit or for, for profit or small business, introduce your organization. Tell us who you are and how we can help. If you have any questions, uh, if you want to have a private one-on-one -on -one session with me, you can do that. It's two hundred dollars an hour. If you want a private one-on-one -on -one session for me, that's possible as well. And I am putting in the chat. You can reach out to uh, my assistant if you do want to book that. But also, let me say, if you buy the course, you will get a special pop-up that reduces the one-on-one -on -one session with me down to only $125 an hour. So once you buy the course, uh, you will get a pop-up. And that's the only time you're going to get this pop-up that you will be able to uh, secure a one-on-one -on -one private session with me for only $125 an hour instead of the normal $200 an hour. So that's that's another opportunity for you. But come to the group and, and absolutely... Um, share who you are and, and how we can help you. So thank you so much, everyone. It's really late, um, but I always promise to answer every question and I did. Thank you so much. Reach out uh, if you have any uh, questions or you know, let me make absolutely sure I have this email that goes to the assistant. All right, and look out for the, for the replay.
because you will have it for sure. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a blessed evening. And hopefully I will see you on April 11th. Bye-bye.